Welcome to In My Beach Boys Room podcast. I am Adam Treiner sitting here with Matthew Hartz. I am your casual Beach Boys fan, don't know a whole lot about their story, although I'm learning more at this point. And I'm sitting here with Matthew Hartz, the Beach Boys expert, also world champion, fiddle player, great music teacher, just awesome musician all around. So we're going to talk about Al Jardine today. But first, we're going to do some social media, which would be our Instagram, which is Matthew Hartz Music, and our Twitter, which is at Matthew underscore Hartz. Uh, one thing we want to mention is that sometimes, and in the in a, the past couple episodes, is we brought props on to the, the podcast, and we have only been thinking about our YouTube viewers, and we have not been thinking about just the audio listeners, so we apologize for not really describing some of those props. We're going to do a better job of doing that for you, but you know, hey, this is our uh, fifth episode. We're still, you know, just just yeah. getting, just learning, you know. Jump on that YouTube and watch the video, too. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The, on those past episodes, you can, you, sh- you should just go watch and, and see the visuals, so... Okay, so Al Jardine is a badass, right? And you say he's a badass because he's what the the least known and most underrated Beach Boy, or well, or how would he, you? He's not a badass because of those things, but he is the least known of the Beach Boys by casual fans, I would say, and very underrated in many different areas as a musician and what his contributions were to the beginning everything okay so elaborate a little bit let tell me why exactly well first can we get into some of his history and background so we can have a backstory yeah yeah yeah. let's let's lay the foundation okay because because al of the five original members was the was not from california he was born in ohio september 3rd 1942 so he's got a 79th birthday coming up this year okay okay um but he he and his folks and his brother came to California in the mid fifties, I think maybe when Al was 12. Um, and it, you know, I'm not sure what his folks, I think his, his dad was a photographer for the railroad was one of his gigs. And so he was moved around quite a bit. I think Al spent some time, not just in Ohio, but maybe up in Michigan. And, um, there's a, there's a book actually, we're going to we're going to show this right now. We're going to show and describe. This is a great book. I think it came out in 2015. James Murphy. This is a good, healthy 500 plus pages on just the first two years that was a revelation for me in so many areas and answered so many questions that I had. Still leaves a few unanswered ones, you know, that, that, uh, I've been searching through it furiously the last couple of days to find some reference, but anyway. Yeah, so we come in the Beach Boys, 1961 to 1963, a nice, beautiful ocean in the background. Yeah. You got a picture Pendle, of... Pendleton shirt. Pendleton the, shirt. The surfing single on a tur- little turntable. And, and then what's that of, picture of That's there? one of the earliest pictures. This is not with Al. This is with David oh, Marks okay. in their Pendleton shirts. But anyway, James Murphy, get this book, read it. It will enhance... Your knowledge of the Beach Boys, for sure. 500 pages on just 1961, 1963. Jeez. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess I so, did learn there's a lot going on in that. So. Anyway, they came to California in 1955. Uh, Al started playing the guitar from what I could tell. I can't find exactly like when he got a guitar and when, how he learned how to play it. Um, I did find reference to his first guitar was a, a the brand Stella, which... Um, was an inexpensive guitar for the time, but it never really says anything other than a quote I see from his mom that says he started listening to Kingston Trio records with a buddy of his, Gary Winfrey, who's a a big part of Al's early story and even later with the Beach Boys. So there's uh, nothing really out there, kind of like the the other Beach Boys, the Wilson Brothers. Yeah, like where they got it. Yeah, mm kind of trace it back. Yeah, I want to know how how Al really learned how to play his guitar. Um, I know that he played a clarinet early on. It makes reference of of that. Um, But anyway, there's... From what I can tell, it's learning with a buddy and listening to Kingston Trio records, which I did that too. My dad was a big Kingston Trio fan, so mm-hmm. right along with the Beach Boys, I got that too. And those songs are a lot easier to play than the Beach Boy songs, right, right. <laughs> so they make a lot more sense for a beginning guitar player. Um, but anyway, his friend Gary Winfrey was a big part of his musical development, and he and Al had a couple of folk groups when in high school before the beach boys thing even happened and so uh i think the most significant one was one called the islanders 
Okay, right. do, I mean, and this is just like a high school group? Yeah, just as a three they buddies. didn't release anything or? or no. No, okay, okay. I, And it was three buddies, and they were covering Kingston Trio stuff, and that was kind of the, the mold, right? That was what that was, that was going to be. And Al, somewhere in there, too, because he, I, I've seen him reference playing the bass with the Islanders, the stand-up bass. Okay, so that's he had to learn how to play a stand-up bass in there somehow too and i've never seen reference of the actual how did he learn how to play that i i play both upright and electric bass and you know the upright is a completely different animal right. you know and and you know i just want to know how he learned how to navigate it i hope to maybe ask al one of these days yeah. um but hit him up on twitter <laughs> no. uh but anyway he, he in high school, when he was going to Hawthorne High School, he would see Brian perform and sometimes with Carl and several interviews, he says, I would see Brian and Carl performed and he was impressed with that. So I think the dynamic going to high school was just Al and Brian seeing each other being in different groups. It's actually... When they graduate and go to, they both go to El Camino Junior College. Um, and in that first semester is when Brian, uh, Al actually it said that he proactively approached Brian and said, hey, let's let's get together and finally do some, some stuff we talked about, you know, getting together on the music. And so that starts Al going over to the Wilson home and making music with, the Wilson brothers and Mike Love, you know. Okay, okay. and so this is and this is kind of what we talk about and how it all got got started, right? In that this episode? is yes, the like this kind of leads into that, leads into that, and then the the surfing single, right, which we talk a lot about in that right. Beach Boys first record, right, 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 right. Okay, but we will talk just briefly about that here because Al played stand up bass on that first record, you know, and. That's significant because there's only three things going on. <laughs> one of the other things is Brian with a one finger on a drum, right? right? right. You know, so his bass is a significant part of that record, and he just stomps through that thing. Mm -hmm. I love the feel. But anyway, Al leaves the group after the first single is released. And there historically, there have been a lot of reasons given for that. Um, early on, I remember when I was first reading my Beach Boys, first Beach Boy books in the late 70s, I'd see stuff, a lot of stuff about Al going to dentistry school or uh -huh. studying to be, went somewhere to be a dentist. And they, the Beach Boys even kind of capitalized on that in a couple of like TV shows where they referenced it and and uh, made jokes about it. Right? Sure, yeah, yeah. And after all these years, I don't think he was ever in dentistry school. <laughs> oh, no, not actually. That's not no, actual truth. I, I think a combination of things he, he or his folks didn't see the thing going where it was going to go with the beach boys. So he wanted to concentrate on his studies a little bit more. Brian had made the decision to just drop out of school and focus on the music, but I wanted to have something to fall back on. And so, um, I think he went back to Michigan where they had lived before once once before and probably a, a semester of college back there i think mm -hmm. and then came back to la so he's only away for a few months maybe okay. um he comes back to la and and hangs out hangs out with the beach boys hangs out with other people associated with the beach boys and and hanging out while and watching while they're playing the shows at the at the grocery stores and the you know doing what they called the 40 freebies that murray just had him doing anything anywhere right, you know? right. and so um shows at grocery stores so he's still Bring hanging that back he's still hanging out and really after reading mr murphy's book and just knowing what i know about it he never really left you okay. know, he was, he was, he's always still kind of, kind of, yeah, there. he was physically gone for that short little time. But when he came back, Brian decides because he, he's got a lot of other things going on besides just the beach boys. He's working with Jan and Dean and the honeys. And I don't know if it's because he had one of those things going on or 
just didn't want to go. But some of those tours in 63, Al was recruited to come in, play the bass, and also sing Brian's falsetto parts on the road with Carl, Dennis, David, and Mike. And there's video footage out there on the internet and pictures all over the place of that combo Mm -hmm. in 63. Al and Dave and Brian or Carl and Dennis and Mike on the road without Brian. And so Al was out there playing the bass, singing those hard falsetto parts Mm -hmm. and doing them consistently well. Also, beginning with the Surfer Girl album, Brian wanted to thicken the rhythm tracks with piano and the technology at that time was basically three track and they wanted two tracks for vocals so you have to get all the music recorded at once in one take Mm -hmm. right so all the instruments have to be playing if i want piano on this i will i was playing bass on the other songs here in the studio Mm -hmm. But now I can't because I'm going to play piano. So I'll get Al to come in and play bass, which Al does on the Surfer Girl album before he's officially a Beach Boy again and the Little Deuce Coop album. I mean, a lot of those albums are Al playing the bass. And he's singing. I know one of my favorite tunes on Little Deuce Coop is No Go Showboat. And in the in the little, uh, there's a little hook in the chorus or the bridge. I don't know what they'd call it. That it's it's Al is the featured voice in there, and he's not even officially a part of the group. The back of the album has a picture of the group with David still. Right, right, so, okay. Anyway, so there, I, the fact that uh, you know he had just learned how to play the guitar as a teenager, listening to Kingston Trio records, and somehow picked up the upright bass, and then uh, comes in starts playing the electric bass on the road and singing the hard parts Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. It's all just like, wow. And then coming into the studio on the released recordings, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that the Beach Boys didn't play on their records. I'm so, and we're going to get into that a little bit more later on, but these early records especially were primarily the Beach Boys and they were doing extra jobs and Mm -hmm. doing things that should have been been beyond their ability and mm-hmm. doing such a good job that you listen to it now and you think it's it's a pro bass player it's not a guy that just picked up a bass right right yeah <laughs> yeah so anyway it's that's when we talk about the the badass part of it i mean we're getting into it now it's it's that natural organic musicianship that the wilson brothers had in spades right, and well, right. well this buddy al he magically had that in a slightly different way but also like under the radar no one really knows that this is like you said i mean the, he's not even he's he has that really cool part on the chorus and he's not even featured on the Nobody knows he's on the record. No, no, nobody knows. Just under the radar. I see. I mean, I understand. I see where you're coming from now a little bit. Where the underrated part, you know, because he's, you know, not. It's not the recognition isn't necessarily there, like the Wilson brothers and and all that. Right, and that was and early on the all of that confusion was. Everybody wondered who the who's this other guy on the front when David, you know, her or when you were in if you got into the Beach Boys later than that, you were looking at those early records and go, Well, that's not the same guy. It was all kinds of confusion. And so that part was under the radar for sure when he wasn't officially a member. But even when he becomes an official member, um, even up through, you know, he starts getting recognized for his contributions sometimes, I think probably around eighty. Oh, wow. I really feel like, but he was really just underrated through that whole period. I remember reviews of of early seventies Beach Boy concerts where the reviewers say is Al Jardine's guitar even plugged in, oh, you wow. know that type of stuff. Oh, that's yeah, kind of rude. Well, but it wasn't even it was it was very far from legitimate, and that especially what I've seen. What I like old school trolls, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, what whatever it was, you know. So anyway, you. You had that going on in 63. In 1964, he's officially back. Okay, recognized okay. as being back. The fir- yeah, because he's on the cover of the Shutdown Got Volume it. 2 album, and that the, they're all wearing the cool blue jackets around Dennis's Stingray, and I think it's Carl's Grand Prix. And so it's one of my favorite album, album covers. Um, 
he's playing bass on a lot of that. I don't know how much I know he plays a lot of guitar too on the, on these records, but I I need to do more in depth study on track by track analysis to see, you know, th- th- I know he's doing bass on Don't Worry Baby, uh, I think Fun Fun Fun. There's probably any. It's just I didn't know that for a long time, and mm-hmm. I guess that's why I keep coming back to it. It's like wow. <laughs> Man, he was doing a lot of work and not even getting credit for right, it. Even exactly. though he's officially a Beach Boy, it doesn't say, "Hey, Al played bass on all the," uh-huh. <laughs> and he plays guitar on the road. You right? Know, yeah. <laughs> um, in July of '64, when we're recording, the, they're recording the Christmas album. He gets his first official lead on a song called "Christmas Day." Um, and lead in like a lead lead? vocal on a beach boy record. So that was officially his first, you know, his voice can be heard in the harmonies and other parts in the, in the, all the, but this is the first official lead vocal. Okay. So I'm not familiar with this tune. Is it a lead? Like the, it's an album cut. Do they do still do their harmonies and and that sort of thing in that? Yeah, there's some. Yeah, some. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but he's the main he's, featured. Well, he's vo- singing voice. the the lead part. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So then we get to 1965, which is a big year for the Beach Boys and Al. Um, one of the uh, the tunes on the Today album, "Help Me, Rhonda," which is recorded in the, in a well, it's the version that's on the Today album. Let's mm-hmm. just say that. And Al has his second lead as a Beach Boy. This is not the hit version of Help Me, Rhonda. On the next album, oh, okay. on Summer Days and Summer Nights, it's another example of Brian saying, you know what? I can do a better version of that. Oh, and Al, man. we're going to do this again. And so there's, if you look at the back of the Summer Days album, it says Help Me, Rhonda. It's spelled differently. It has an H in Rhonda this time. And then it has, uh, in parentheses, the single version because they released it differently as a single. So I'll have to play you those two versions back to back. They're the same year even. <laughs> and and uh, very different? I mean, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to, okay, I yeah. mean, yeah, it's, it's so different that I was really confused because I the Endless Summer compilation in 74, they accidentally didn't use the hit version of Help Me Rhonda that huge album they did used the album yeah they oh, did well. they and be true to your school they didn't use this hit single versions they used the album cuts instead and that was absolutely a mistake of theirs oh wow because they you know, they should have used the hit the, the right ones that went right. that that everybody knows right? yeah yeah well that were the hits right right and so anyway that's al al has a huge claim to fame there and that you know that was the beach boys second number one single when it did come out in in 65 the single version after the today album but on the today album uh al's playing uh bass on when i grow up to be a man and the one that i didn't know all of this until fairly recently but the one that blew me away is uh he's playing bass on she knows me too well on side two of the today album and once someone told me that i was able to oh that is the beach boys on that track another interesting thing about uh summer days and summer nights is uh owls not on the cover and so there's only four beach boys i'm on looking there. right at the, the cover three, and that the is three, true he is not on there yep three wilson brothers and mike love um and on the back it tells why that al was sick and so he wasn't able to make the cover but i've always thought that was strange this was one of my first the first of my three albums when i was very little and mm-hmm. so trying to put this story together in my head was confusing enough (laughs) (laughs) but anyway he's not on the cover but he's again playing bass on uh i heard the other day he's playing bass on girl from new york city which just is a stomping beach boys tune that nobody knows about there's other tunes on there 65 was a big year for al because of those things and also because he suggested to brian in the end of 65 to do sloop john b and that was from his love of the Kingston trio. And so Sloop, Sloop John B was his idea? Yeah, was oh. Al's idea. Like, and oh, and he he wanted to do it, brought it to Brian. And he had done it uh, 
when he was covering Kingston Trio stuff and l- liked the tune. And I, Brian had even done it with a group when he was in high school, too. Okay, sorry. Is Sloop John B. not a Beach Boys original? No. Oh, it's a Kingston Trio yeah, cover. Yeah, it's a cover. Oh, okay. Well, it's not even a Kingston Trio song. It's an old folk tune oh, okay. that's been around forever and ever and ever. Got so it, it's got not it. a... Yeah. Okay, now I'm with you. So anyway, he says, let's do Sloop John B. And in one interview i think al said you know the quote was brian says ah, i'm not into the kingston trio or whatever and kind of dis like he dismissed it but he sat down and said let's do it and maybe you can you know add some of the beach boy dimension to it i think al said i suggested a couple of chord changes or something like that but basically left brian with the idea and came back a couple days later, and the, none of the vocals, but Brian had the music track completely done. And Al said, you're just like, whoa. You, it's this, when you hear it without the vocals, it sounds like a John Phillips Sousa production, like a almost a big march, you know, mm-hmm. just like the glockenspiel in it and the just the, the way it moves in spots. It's just, it is a brilliant production, but I can imagine Al went for the, hey, let's do Sloop John B. Because like, whoa, we really, I guess we did. Sloop, we, yeah, we're doing we really Sloop did, John yeah. B. Yeah. <laughs> but that was, that Al didn't get label credit for that. And I know that he feels slighted because of that, because that was his idea, idea to do yeah. that tune. And Well, hey, we got your back, Al. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Um, so he did a lot of amazing singing on pet sounds too and the smile project i think the what really impresses me about al starting about post pet sounds is he was the first guy singing wouldn't it be nice live brian's singing the lead on the studio version mm. um and did a really strong great job on a tough tune to sing all the stuff i hear from the live recordings from 66 and 67 i mean he just does a great job with that tune and and the other stuff that he sings he's always historically throughout their career such a strong dependable voice in mm-hmm. that band you know yeah, um, be able to sing that song that, yeah. yeah and then he's also again early on when the when brian didn't tour and he and david were with the group he was singing the falsetto parts but after you know after the mid 60s after Gwan, or after brian quit the road for good um, the falsetto thing was passed around between them, including Bruce Johnston, who was brought in after Brian quit for good. Then we don't have David Marks anymore, right? We've just got the Wilson brothers, Mike Love and Al Jardine. We recruit Bruce Johnston, who is an, a big part of the story. We're not going to get into it right now, but he came in and he sang some falsetto parts in the concerts too. They kind of, and Carl would do some of the falsetto stuff too. I've heard in the, harmony stacks around this time but they kind of they were all such great musicians that they could kind of rotate and kind of trade that off like musical chairs Mm -hmm. it's another just great aspect of their musicianship it's just it should have been too hard for him to do yeah you know it should you know so i think that's a, a big reason that i admire his musicianship in that late 60s and then on through the 70s he was doing all the falsetto parts on all my favorite live recordings of that period. Um, The Friends album in 68, he gets involved writing more um, with with, uh, Brian specifically. I love Wake the World. He helped write Friends. There's a few others on that tune. And then I've heard a rumor. There's a tune on there called Be Here in the Morning that falsetto always had sounded weird to me on there but it's it was assumed to be either, uh, brian or maybe carl singing at this but it's uh al jardine on Wait, you that know record. it you know it's al i think i know that i heard that from a reputable source and and i had always wondered about the timbre of that real it's an extremely high part i'll okay. have to play that for you it's it's but anyway that's al on on there yeah i'm, okay. I'm like really really sure <laughs> yeah so um you had that in 69 my birth year uh that was a big year for al because he he suggested another folk tune that was big for the beach boys on another a lot cover? of levels yeah so this is an old uh lead huddy Ledbetter tune called cotton fields 
um, that everybody knows the old cotton field. Or you, we used to, everybody used to know you're too young, Adam. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, hey, I might know, maybe. But, you know, I just got to hear it again. But anyway, Al uh, helped to produce. They, they actually did two versions of this one. Brian kind of helped produce a version that was on the 2020 album. And then Al thought, ah, I think we can add some sparkle to this. And he reproduced it and had put a steel guitar on it. And it was a big hit internationally. It wasn't big in America, but it was big in a couple places overseas, especially in England, but a couple other places too. Um, it became a big hit for them that they would perform a lot, especially in the early 70s. The 70s were a big part of Al's story because he helped carry the band. Um, he, when they moved to Holland for the big Sur thing, uh, his California saga project with Mike, that's a big highlight of that thing. And, and, uh, I love that tune and I have a cool story about that tune later on, but it's, he's, it's such a strong voice on all of the 70s stuff, get on to the late 70s stuff. I just thinking off the top of my head, honking down the highway from the Love You album. Um, the the MIU album, 1978. MIU. Yeah, Maharishi Institute oh, okay. University. It's oh, a, yeah, it's yeah, a, yes, a, yes, yes. So they went back to, I think it's Ohio, I think is where that is. No, Iowa. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I'm getting I Ohio yeah. with Al. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. in Iowa. And Idaho. Podcast, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm yeah, yeah. really messing everything so up now for us. With that, the MIU album, he was a producer basically on that record. He had a lot to do with um, the recording of that album and getting things going. I, and I love a lot of the, the t I love Pitter Patter from that one. And, uh, God. Oh, come and go with me. But he, he's all over that thing. And, and then 79, the L.A. Light album. I love Lady Linda from that is, is a favorite. Um, and then in 1980, they actually, the Beach Boys go to Big Sur to Al's place and record in his Big Red Barn Studios the Keeping the Summer Alive album. Okay. So that was all done at Al's place and... And they hung out there for, you know, a while all together. So that was a kind of a cool time for them, I'm sure. There's a there's a documentary on on the internet that you can find about them. And there's a really like funny recording in the uh, documentary about recording there. Yeah, oh, and they okay, walk cool. down to the beach, and it's uh, Brian gives one of the funniest interviews that <laughs> it's just hilarious. I'll have to show you, but it's just. It's really nice, and it's it's fun to watch them all laugh together. Yeah, make each other laugh. Yeah, and so even throughout the eighties and the nineties up till now, and especially after Carl passed away in nineteen ninety eight, you know, I was just had the strongest, most reliable voice. Yeah, yeah, and it just consistent sound. I mean, it seems like the whole thing. You know, whether it's with you know, I saw him with the Beach Boys many times, but. The most recent time was on the 50th anniversary tour. Um, whether it's that or whether he's with Brian in his band, which he does a lot, he goes out with them, or it's with his own groups. Um, and he's had a couple of things, you know, that are Beach Boy related that he's gone out with. It's just he's always the, he's a highlight. Mm -hmm. He's a highlight. He carries. He, he just he still seems strong physically. Yeah. To, 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 you know, or to, at least to me, just in, in, in a, in a great entertainer nice. and, and a good band leader, you know, I just, I, I really admire him and, and I'm really glad to do this episode just to hopefully people will yeah, shine understand a little, a little bit more. Yeah, I, there's exactly. a lot of people that do know, you yeah. know, but I just more and more people but should But I think know. it's, I mean, I think you, you have a good point in the, in the fact that, everybody knows the Wilson brothers and, and that he just based off of them being the brothers and, and Brian being who Brian is that he easily does get overlooked. Yeah. And I think the fact that you're doing an episode to kind of shine a little light on the fact that he is this reliable, talented musician is, you know, I think, I think that's a good call on your part. For oh sure. yeah. And, and something yeah. that maybe other people aren't really seeing this. I'll tell you what he, he put together a group. 
I wish I knew exact dates on some of this stuff, but he called it the Beach Boy family and friends, which caused some problems. <laughs> Ooh, controversy again. <laughs> that, well, that, well, it was uh, his sons, Matthew and Adam. Hey, we, we don't know if we've talked about yeah. that yet. Because when I was little that. in the early 70s, when, long lost sons. when I was just getting into the Beach Boys, one of the first things my mom did find out, and I don't know that, that uh, Al had a son named Matthew, and boy, I was pretty proud of that. <laughs> Man, I just became proud knowing that he has a yeah, son. Yeah, and, and I and, and we we put straighter. We act, but anyway, uh, Al's sons Matthew and Adam, and then Brian's daughters Carney and Wendy, who were the famous part of Wilson Phillips, the pop group, you know, that were just hugely successful. And those two gals are two of my favorite singers. Just such amazing musicians. Um, and then. Uh, so those were singing wise. I think that was the, the heart of what was going on. But then he, the band Al put together was just a lot of the old beach boys touring guys like Billy Henshee and Ed Carter and, and just the, the kind of the classic lineup from the, I love Ed Carter and his bass playing and, and his guitar playing and everything else. But any band that's got Ed Carter in it's got my vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's it's if you get a chance to check out some of that stuff from it, there's a live album, uh, Al Jardine, Beach Boys, Family and Friends, live from Las Vegas. Cool. Pretty pretty good, pretty good deal. I'd like to see more of that. Yeah. Okay, and then so you also have a pretty cool story that you've told me that I really enjoy. I think it's a it's a cool story about meeting Al's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, uh, and that was at like a, a music, uh, a camp or something like a, that? It was a, a week-long music camp that I was teaching at in Big Sur in oh. 2010. Oh, in, where he, where it, his studio is? Yeah, where he lives. Oh, he lives there too. Okay. Yeah, and believe me, when I got that gig, I knew that, I, I think I'd been to Big Sur before, but not very, you know, not for a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I knew that... Uh, Al was from there. So I thought was thinking about that. As a matter of fact, I was with my nephew and my dad on a spring break trip the week before that. And I, dad was asking me about the trip. And, and uh, I said, yeah. I said, you know, Al Jardine lives in Big Sur. And he goes, are you going to try to find it? I said, ah, no. I said, if I have some time, I might run around and try to find the studio. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know. And so anyway, I got to. You don't want to go knock on his door, be one of those fans? <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, I got and I had a job to do anyway. Right. You that's know, true. I had yeah. to do performances and teach clinics and classes. And so anyway, I got to that um, camp and they had all of the teachers staying with host families. And the host family that I was staying with, they found out I was a Beach Boy fan. And uh, the mother in the family, she said, well, I went to school with Al's son, Matthew. Did you know he lives right here in Big Sur? And I get, I didn't, yeah, I did know that. <laughs> but <laughs> to play he, cool, right? yeah, no, he goes, she goes, he just lives right down the hill. And I'm thinking, oh, the story gets even better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then it started, uh, I started hearing murmurs around the camp that uh, because I was such a Beach Boy fan, they were going to try to get Al to come to the end of the week concert that we were the instructors that were there were going to be putting on an, a show and then some of the kids were going to be doing some things from, you know, so they talked about the possibility of him or they were trying to get him to come. And so I've heard that kind of stuff before, every, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Don't get your you hopes know? Oh, no, yeah. no, 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 no. But believe me, when I was in my yurt, <laughs> uh, preparing for things, I thought, you know, it might be kind of smart to get an Al Jardine tune ready for this uh this weekend's performance maybe i can have the kids do it. <laughs> you know and so i actually i thought of a couple of things but then i mean i don't the first thing should have been uh al wrote a tune that's called california a it's part of the california saga on the holland album that's all about big sur okay it's about you know, it's just a big sur anthem it's a great great tune and so got a lot of lyrics is the problem. My problem is always lyrics, not the music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've told me that you 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 sometimes don't even pay attention to the lyrics. You're always so engrossed in the, yeah, the music right, itself. Yeah, right, right. So anyway, as I, you know, and I sang that song so many times, I realized how many words me and my brother made up to those tunes <laughs> that weren't actually right, you know. Right. But anyway, got the 
got the words and I had a group of students in one of the classes. I said, okay, guys, we're going to, we're going to learn this just in case, you know, we're going to learn. So taught so it to just them. to paint the picture a little better, uh, what age of students are, do you have here? There, oh, these were, this, this was a range of kids that could have been teenage years on up into their twenties and thirties. Okay. okay. These so are not, not young kids. These no, are actually, you know, they, they've been playing music for a while. This, this okay. is a kind this, a an advanced music camp where it's just, uh, pretty small in size and that there's not a whole bunch of people there, you, you know, maybe 40 or 50 participants okay, that have had to it. audition. Oh, okay. Sort of a okay, deal. So you yeah, know, yeah, they really, know what they're doing. Okay. So you got them working on Big Sur, right? Well, the the song California, California, oh, it's not called Big Sur, no, but it's okay, about Big Sur. Okay. So I've got them working on that just because the concert's coming up and we're going to do it anyway, whether or not Al shows up or not. But I don't get tuned in on Al showing up at all, right? And I've got other things I've got to do and at the concert besides play the fiddle and play the guitar for other people and still got to teach that week. And so I get focused and not even really thinking about it that much. And anyway, the concert comes up that night and and it had gotten started and I was sitting backstage kind of off to the side, but I saw Al walk in to kind of at the top of a stairwell, mm -hmm. you know, and I just kind of smiled a little bit to myself and it wasn't too long. Somebody came running back to the Al Tartes. I, like, I, I, yes, I saw him. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see him till right at first. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, he, the concert went on. I did a, a segment where I did a, a fiddle tune with a, a couple of incredible musicians I play with a lot. And then they also accompanied me on an original pop deal that uh, is embarrassingly Beach Boys flavored. Mm -hmm. And then I got the those kids to do uh, the Big Sur tune. And, and, well, and he was in the audience. Well, he was in the audience. Very yeah. cool. And so, yeah. 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 And so, uh, and it's in the front half of the show and there's an intermission. And on intermission, he came back and uh, I got to meet him uh, and so we talked to he asked me a little bit about the, the fiddle stuff um about specifically about the tune i played which is called shuck in the bush and and this and is I, your the, your tune or this is a, no, no this is a traditional fiddle okay. tune and i think his 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 uh wife um she knew something about bluegrass or something like that i remember him asking me about that and then he mentioned the fact that my original tune had a few Brian Wilson chat. I said, Oh my God, let's don't even go there. You know, and I, <laughs> because that's, I'm such a germ, you know, <laughs> yeah. such a nerd, but, uh, I did get to ask him some really cool questions that, and I'm glad I, I, I got to ask him some of these things at, because that was a moment. Right. And, uh, I specifically, I wanted to know how he and Carl approached learning their guitar parts post pet sounds being, you know, having to kind of recreate what a lot of studio musicians were doing in the studio and come up with something satisfying to give the listener in a live performance of a wouldn't it be nice or a God only knows. And I've heard those live recordings. They did a dang good job. And so I got to ask him some, some cool questions about that. And I think I might save some of the answers for later on in another podcast. Oh, but cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be, but it was... It was it w another funny thing about that is we we talked for a little while and then there were some other people that wanted to visit with him and I needed to visit with some other people but we were still in the general vicinity of each other and I was talking to this other group of people but I guess my mind and my ear was still on Al Jardine right and uh, he was talking with them and they asked him. I heard one of them say, oh, did the Beach Boys ever record at your studio? And he goes, oh, yes, yes, the Keeping the Summer the Alive album that came out. And he, had, he must have known from the conversation. He goes, Matt, what year did you? I said, 1980. <laughs> About yeah, that must be, fast. Right? Uh, I've got buddies that just love that story. And he, and he must so, have known they, I was, he knew I was still listening too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. in proximity to each yeah. other and, and knowing that you, the knowledge you have, he probably could, I mean, he knew you yeah. could answer better than right, he could. Well, and uh, yeah, it, the whole thing was just beautiful and I couldn't have scripted it any better. And I know we've got a picture from that with yeah. me and Al that we've got up there. So that was a really cool moment. So after that concert, there was a, a few days left in the, the camp and 
we were trying to coordinate going down to the Big Red Barn studio, but I know Al was super, super busy, and uh, we it never lined up, but the, uh, the family I was staying with, they took me down to his place and i got to get my picture get a picture there which will, the, yeah we'll put up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, cool. so that was uh you know so al jardine is a badass and not you know and he not is. just a badass musician but seems to be a pretty badass guy to you know, yeah he is and I, he's a he's a he's a badass reason that the beach boys are still cranking today cra- well yeah. that he, he he's just he's a huge part of this story and i want to continue to bring more more light to keeping it clean with al jardine nice. <laughs> okay and that will do it for this episode of the podcast if you want to support the podcast we have a patreon page uh, you can either search in my beach boys room podcast or matthew hearts and it'll come up and also if you want to learn music matthew hearts is actually a really uh, good music teacher as you heard in this uh, episode that he's taught clinics and stuff like that so if you want to learn music matthewheartsmusic.com we got teaching videos uh that if they're not up by now then you can just hop on our email list and we will let you know as soon as that is available so we will see you next time and thank you so much for listening